So hello everyone and welcome to the corporate brokerage FinTrack compliance training. As you are all very aware, um, we are very strict with our compliance regime at the corporate brokerage. And I wanna welcome people from across Canada today. Um, I believe we have some staff that have joined the brokerage recently um, in our BC location, uh, or maybe more than one of our BC locations. Um, and as well uh, as our greater Toronto area locations. Um, what I would suggest you do at this point in time, if you could at the bottom of the chat, if you want to speak to panelists only, um, in the chat you just change that to all panelists. If there's something that you would like to bring to the attention of all of the attendees, then you should change that at the bottom of the chat to all panelists and all attendees. Um, as I said, we will be taking questions at the end. Um, and we do have a bit of a schedule to, to try and keep only because there is quite a lot of information to cover in this program today. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. This, as I said, is the FinTrack compliance training for all of Royal LePage Sussex, uh, West Real Estate Services, Johnston and Daniel, our commercial folks, as well as Royal LePage Real Estate Services. FinTrack is a very complex issue, as you know, and it is a federal program, as you also know. Um, there is many terms that we will be talking about and sort of throwing out to you today um, that you should be aware of. Um, but also to keep in mind that um, when we're discussing compliance, that the course that you're taking today uh, is really a one, one part of your compliance. And it is the only compulsory course that we offer in our dynamic agent program. Um, and this course, um, as I've mentioned earlier, it is also something that's taught specifically um, to the agents, but also to all of our staff all of our managers, as well as our head office. So everybody is working pretty much off the same, and I will say very strict guidelines because we are in the age of compliance when it comes to FinTrack at this brokerage. In addition to this course, um, we do have a FinTrack policy that we will go over with you um, later in this, uh, in this course. Um, and that in addition to signing it, as well as a quiz that you will be asked to complete. Um, and again, we'll give you the links for the quiz a little bit later. So today our learning objectives are very clear. We're going to talk about why uh, good compliance matters to your business, to our brokerage, and basically your role and responsibilities as a realtor not only in our province, but across Canada um, with regards to the CREA forms that we use um, to fill out, as well as understanding your responsibility as the first line of defense to deter financial crimes. Because let's be honest, and we all know this, um, unless you live under a rock, uh, Canada is a hotspot for money laundering and unfortunately for terrorist financing to a certain degree. Um, and real estate is in that circle. Um, there is large cash involved. There's large financial tra uh, transactions that happen on a daily basis. And as a, an entity, real estate as an industry is on high alert. Um, you can see here on this slide, um, and again, if you're reading the Globe and Mail, the National Post, um, it's happening. In, in real estate. Um, so it's important for you to understand sort of how that happens, but also again, your role in it. So as an entity, real estate is in good company. Uh, you can see on this chart here um, that there's other financial entities involved as well as life insurance, British Columbia notaries, accountants, casinos, and um, securities dealers, as well as uh, dealers in precious stones and metals. So real estate really has come under scrutiny from FinTrack. 
um, in the last several years because of its involvement with large transactions, obviously, and things like liens that can be put on homes and that kind of thing. So it is definitely an area where reporting as well as um, investigations, and we'll call them FinTrack. Um, they come in on a regular basis and they actually do audits. Um, one of our um, brokerages, I believe it was West last year, it could have been Sussex, um, that they did have a, a, a FinTrack investigation uh, where they come in and they go through all of your files and they make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is filling out the forms correctly, keeping good records and actually participating on and knowing who our clients are. And we'll get into that. And ultimately why compliance matters, why it matters to our brokerage, um, to you as a realtor, as well as to the Royal LePage brand and the Johnson and Daniel brand. Um, it also helps minimize your risk of, of fines and judgments because <laughs> I mean, no one wants to be in that position. Let's be honest, whether it's with our uh, RICO or our, um, our boards, uh, FinTrack is keeping an eye. So it helps to minimize this training and knowledge of this training is a really important avenue for you to uh, minimize risk. And then of course, in this business, what we have is we have our reputation, we have our time. And as a brokerage and as a brand, that really matters and it makes a big difference. But more importantly, it's the law. So the Proceeds of Crime Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Act, that is the federal law that um, is the objective that we all follow. And it is there to help deter and detect money laundering and financing of terrorist activities. And keep in mind, this law is put into place on a federal level, of course, but because of the associations and the financial units that FinTrack reports to. So keeping in mind that Canada is part of a larger network, of financial units. FinTrack is our reporting unit and keeping track of our compliance, um, the different entities. But the financial units are basically in charge of keeping their areas, their countries safe and held to a certain level of compliance. And when we talk about a weak anti-money anti laundering regime, for instance. Canada is not on that list currently, and we wanna keep it that way. And it's our job as a brokerage participating in this industry to keep you informed and to make sure that we're doing everything that we legally are asked to do. So ultimately, when you're getting someone pushing back, like, well, why do you need this information for me? Why do you have to fill these out so, so clearly? Why do you need that information um, about my, my wife or my sister or whoever? It's the law, ultimately. And we'll, we'll get into that. But it, it, it is as serious as that. And ultimately, it's up to you to be able to communicate that very clearly to your clients, whether they're buyers, or sellers. And ultimately, as I mentioned, FinTrack um, stands for Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Center of Canada. And it is an independent government agency. It operates at an arm's length from the law. Really, really important because some people think it is the law. They're like the little police that come and check these things. It doesn't work that way. FinTrack is Canada's financial unit, and it is responsible to, again, the greater powers um, on a global scale for keeping our country safe and to keep it in a strong anti-money laundering regime and to keep our compliance, um, we'll call it, keep our com compliance toes close to the fire, right? Its official mandate is detection, prevention, and deterrence. So again, they're not the police. FinTrack is the reports analysis center. So they analyze data. 
We, as realtors, provide that data when asked. So they're not in our business every day. They're specifically for the uh, organization of the data, okay? And as real estate agents, we report to that financial. As real estate industry, we report to that financial, that information. Again, when called upon um, in these in audits and investigations. And ultimately, what is um, having to be reported are suspicious transactions, large cash transactions, and then of course, terrorist properties. And they're real. The fines, the consequences of non-compliance is real. So your failure to fill out the forms properly, your failure to complete the receipt of funds record, not maintaining records appropriately, things in writing. These are the kinds of things that FinTrack looks for in these investigations and ultimately does, does give fines out. And they do give fines out to brokerages as well as independent contractors, so you. So if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, we're, we're usually catching it, but if for some reason we don't, which doesn't really happen, we're pretty on top of these things, but if you're not keeping your own records very clear, this could result in you having some pretty serious fines. And you can see what the individual level is and the brokerage level is. And no one wants to be there, trust me. And ultimately there are criminal penalties as well. So we're not just talking about fines. We're talking about um, criminal violations. And FinTrack may notify law enforcement of non-compliance. And that's when the, the legal system gets involved. And for really failing to report and failing to um, provide this information directly. Um, so I talk about investigations that FinTrack comes out and they do on a regular basis. And believe me, they're lining up to do more this year in 2021. Uh, that's increasing on a yearly basis. 2020 was a little bit different in that obviously everything was different in 2020. They didn't do as many on-site investigations. So coming right on site to the brokerage and asking, you know, can I have the deals from January uh, 2020 to June 2020, every copy of every deal that you've done with every agent that's done them. And we want that in the next 30 minutes kind of thing. Like it's that stringent. Um, but that being said, this, these kinds of record keeping requirements, they do, they will result. If we're not doing it properly, you're not doing it properly. They could be uh, criminal penalties as well. We don't want anyone in that position. We don't wanna be in that position, which is why we're so strict about um, keeping on top of the training and making sure that everyone here knows what's expected of you as being an agent in our brokerage. So let's get into it. So compliance responsibilities. What a few things we're gonna cover today. Um, I just wanna make sure too, you guys are all following, you have copies of all of this that was sent to you in the Google Drive. So you have access to all of this. And again, if there's any questions, we're, we're going to take them at the end. So your compliance responsibilities. So when it comes to risk management, we break it down into geographic risk, risk, cus customer risk, and transactional risk. We talk about knowing your client, making sure you're filling out the proper identification for each individual involved in the transaction, as well as when there's corporations or entities involved, and making sure that we're very clear that we're doing that correctly, that the right paperwork's being used, as well as identification of business relationships with the corporate brokerage. It's a very unique position to be in if you're working at the corporate brokerage because FinTrack identifies it a little different. We'll get into that. And then third-party verifications. Is there anyone who is involved with this transaction, whose name might not be on the agreement of purchase and sale, for instance. Is anybody contributing money to this process or to the contribution 
that are their contributing funds that needs to be identified. That's very important. And then of course, our receipt of funds record. FinTrack reporting expects that there's three levels of, of FinTrack reporting. One is suspicious transaction report, which would be done through the brokerage. Another is a large cash transaction report, which as you are all aware, we do not accept cash. We don't accept cash in little, you know, briefcases. <laughs> we don't accept cash um, from a perspective of wire transfers or direct deposits. We've had that situation come up in, in the last little while. We do not accept that. That's not something that's allowed through our banks. Um, so we don't tend to get into those kinds of reports. And then the terrorist property reports. Um, I've been in the business 20 years. I've not seen this kind of report go through any brokerage I've ever worked with. Doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just obviously a more difficult thing to uncover, we'll call. Um, with regards to record keeping and audits, um, we'll touch on that a little bit. But again, know that this is the kind of thing that the brokerages tend to um, take on and be responsible for. Um, and more specifically, something that, um, that our broker of record and our compliance officer sp speaks to directly. But we'll get into that a little later. So off we go. Risk management. So we talk about geographic risk as something that um, we identify areas where people might be coming from that would have potentially a weak anti-money laundering regime or an area people are coming to buy from an area that supports or funds terrorism or has a high degree of political corruption. So you're all aware of OSFI. OSFI is also the same office that um, put in the mortgage stress test, what, like 18 months ago or so, maybe more. Um, they also, in conjunction with FinTrack, this is something that's slightly changed in the last little while. They do publish regular updates as to who are on these sanction lists. So countries on these sanction lists. So if your business includes people coming from outside of Canada to operate or buy or sell real estate, then you should be aware of which countries are on these sanctioned lists. If you're getting contacted by people in these countries, then you should be aware what your reporting looks like or what kind of risk mitigation you need to put in place or ultimately speak to your manager because we can help you sort of navigate this. This doesn't happen very often. We have had it happen in this brokerage. Again, we're very big brokerage. Um, so people are get, getting contacted all the time online from contacts that they have. Um, so a really important thing for you to be aware of that there are lists and these lists get changed all the time. So regimes are constantly trying to improve their compliance with regards to anti-money laundering and terrorist financing. Canada, for instance, um, we do this on a regular basis where we dig a little deeper, and we update our process and we make sure that FinTrack makes sure that, that the real estate industry, for instance, is, is on top of these things. And we get checked in on, and we keep on top of these things, obviously on behalf of everyone in the brokerage. But something you should be aware of as well that these things do change. With regards to cons 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 consumer rather <laughs> or customer risk, um, obviously that that you're asking questions and you're you're being critical with regards to the individuals that you're working for. And specifically, are there unusual involvement of third parties, for instance? Are there multiple people that don't really make sense coming together to? to sort of form this sort of partnership to buy this, this, this country property, for instance, that it doesn't really make sense. Is there a, a large geographic distance, for instance, between where they want to buy and where their life is for like they're living in um, Toronto, but they want to buy something in Waterloo? Well, it might make sense because their son or daughter just decided to go to university there or 
something along those lines, but that's where you have to be a little bit critical and does it make sense. And then also titling these residential properties in the name of a third party. Is there an entity involved that maybe um, sort of got slid into the transaction last minute? Was this legal entity something that was started legitimately? Is this something that you can keep track of, which is expected, you're expected to do. Um, but it's also just making sense of the matter. So knowing your client in this particular instance is a really important thing to know who they are, where they're coming from, where they're referred to you from. Um, and with regards to high ranking political officials. So that could be someone that you're not even aware that maybe the husband or the wife that you're working with, um, their spouse is, um, is someone who's high ranking in government. And, and you may just need to ask those questions. So it's important for you to know who it is you're working with so that you can put the, the puzzle piece together that this transaction is, is a low risk transaction ultimately. We also talk about transactional risk. So seeing under or overvalued properties um, and selling them for maybe not really caring that they sold uh, quickly and maybe they owned it for a smaller amount of time. Um, maybe they're using large amounts of cash to, to bring to the, 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 the transaction. And does that make sense? Does it make sense that that buyer would have that much money? That buyer who does this for a living has that much cash on hand, those kinds of things. But also with the individual's occupation, does it make sense that someone who works from what they've told you in this role can afford that kind of property? Um, and without asking those questions, you wouldn't really know. Um, is there another person involved? Is there an entity involved that we need to be aware of? And then of course, the speeds of transactions, like just flip it, get rid of it. It doesn't matter. We just want to move the money around. <laughs> that's that's some, sometimes they're, they're doing something like a smurfing where they're just trying to move money quickly and they're using multiple people to do it, for instance. So there could be a bigger scheme that's being, that's operating. Um, and unless you ask good questions, you couldn't inadvertently know, you couldn't inadvertently be part of something that you're not really sure is going on in the background. And that's, those are the kinds of things as a real estate professional, you really should be aware of um, if those things are happening um, with your transactions. And then of course, there is the option um, where people have bought properties without viewing it. Um, sometimes that makes sense. And I'll just share a brief story. I sold in downtown Toronto for many years. Um, I was a buyer agent. I had met with the clients, but they did not live locally. One lived in Calgary. They both lived in Calgary, but at the time a property came up they couldn't see the property. They were both out of town. One was in Calgary, one was actually in Hong Kong, I believe on a business trip. So they couldn't actually physically see the property before they made an offer on it and a successful offer. But we knew we'd been working with this client for a while. We knew what they would love it. Um, they, go, they went ahead and made the offer remotely. At the time, I think we were even faxing, if you can believe it, offers back and forth. Uh, for signature. Um, and, but that made sense. And, it, and to this day, they still live there. So it was, we had found the property for them. It was a very unique property. We knew it would work for them. They saw it, they bought it without viewing the property, but ultimately it made sense. So it wasn't that, it wasn't a flag that we would wave in that particular case. But that's something that you could, you should keep an eye on. That does happen from time to time where people are just like, no, just buy, you know, buy sight unseen. And, and sometimes that would make sense, but ultimately you have to ask those questions. So ultimately risk management is what we're talking about. And when we dive a little later into the, in the course, into the, the, um, the paperwork, the forms, you'll see on page three, this is where you identify the risk. So if there is some sort of risk, if there's a high risk individual, if there's a medium risk, most of the deals we're dealing with, I'm gonna say 
7% of the deals we do, um, and that's a lot of deals, there's a low risk to who we're dealing with. But make sure that you're filling this form out. Every page gets touched. This is page three, where we identify what the risk is. And then ultimately managing that risk, if we do see some sort of risk, we need to know that we've assigned risk and that we're keeping track of these things and that we're obtaining the proper information. If there is an element of risk, what are we doing to mitigate it? And are we keeping good records? And definitely, definitely contact your manager so that they can have a conversation with our compliance officer and broker of record. This might be something that we've seen already. Um, and of course, you wouldn't necessarily know that. Um, but ultimately, we need to be aware um, as a, at the brokerage level if there is some risk being assigned. And the best way to mitigate risk ultimately is work with people you know. <laughs> and how do you know your clients? Um, and how do you keep track of them? So FinTrack has um, given very clear, very concise um, guidelines on the kind of information we need to collect. CREA, Canadian Real Estate Association, has designed forms um, for us to work within. Um, the physical identification of people face-to-face, -face, obviously a little trickier now, under COVID, <laughs> um, but when you do have that opportunity to be face-to-face, -face, um, that's a great way to, you know, can I see your driver's license, fill out the form um, and move on. Non-face-to-face, -face, um, which we are encountering more and more of, here we are in yet another Zoom call, uh, doing some fantastic training, um, but of course, we're not in a classroom together to do that. So there are methods to do this process of identifying your, your, your clients in a non-face-to-face -face method. And we're gonna talk about that. There's a few ways to do that. And then of course, identifying if there's this risk rating um, when, and where we collect that information. Um, I will say further with regards to the business ID, um, confirming that there, if there is a business that we have a separate form to do that on. So if there's a corporation, a numbered company, a partnership that are conducting business in for that specific transaction, we have a set of forms that we use for that, okay? and. In order to identify that company or in entity appropriately, we need to also obtain copies of their corporate records, specifically a status certificate, articles of incorporation, authorized signatories. You're confirming the names of the directors and officers, and you're determining bas basically the entity control, who has control of the shares. And as we talked about business relationships, so let me just do a little sidebar here. Business relationships are by FinTrack's definition considered a sale or a purchase two or more times in the last five years. Okay, so multiple transactions within five years. If that's the case, FinTrack's expectation is that you still reconfirm identification and then you consider if there's any other sanction screening risk mitigation that has to be done. What we expect in the corporate brokerage, and this is across Canada again, because we're such a big brokerage, just our sheer scale, we suggest every single person and we actually mandate that every single person that we work with is considered a business relationship with the corporate brokerage. We're just too big. So imagine this scenario. Um, we have a, a J&D agent in downtown Toronto um, working with a, a client to sell their property in Forest Hill. Okay, that same person is trying to buy a property with someone in Oakville at one of our Oakville locations 
um, a condo for their mother that they're going to purchase in Burlington. So you see very different transactions, but the same client and the same brokerage. So we're a big brokerage. All of our clients are considered in a business relationship. Hence the final page of the identif individual identification record has to, be con has to be ticked off a business relationship, whether it's commercial or residential, you, you decide, but it must be considered, they're all considered business relationships. So let's dive into the actual process of identifying. So methods for identifying our clients. So there's the photo ID method, again, face-to-face. -face. And what has happened this past year in particular, again, FinTrack is updating things all the time. FinTrack says, and they, the, it never used to be the case, but now you can identify someone this way. So they're never used to allow Skype or FaceTime or Zoom um, to be used for, the, for uh, per, the, uh, the purpose of identifying a client. So you couldn't hold up your uh, driver's license, for instance, and say, yeah, this is me. Um, and now they're saying temporarily, we can do that. Okay, so that is something that has changed. It's temporarily changed. You must remark on your FinTrack form that this was done digitally. And then when there is an opportunity to be face-to-face -face, that you can just say, you know, just can I see that driver's license again? I just wanna make sure that I have all that down correctly. And then remark on the date when it was done in person as well. So that's really important just for business to keep going. Um, FinTrack recognized that this is something that they needed to have a closer look at. With regards to the credit file method, of course, this and the dual ID process method is something that even outside of COVID can be done in a non face to face method. Um, the credit file method is something that requires the client's um, approval or consent because ultimately checking their credit file for the purposes of identifying them still does affect their beacon score. It shows that somebody was in checking. Um, it's not checking their credit, it's checking that this person is who they say they are, right? The dual ID process method, the same, non-face-to-face -face, where you can use multiple um, ways to identify the different data points that are required. Uh, data points, I call it the, the, the digital DNA, so date of birth, name, and address. And in some cases, um, when it comes to the dual ID process method, it could be even a financial institution or credit card just to confirm that this is the person that we're dealing with. In some cases, a mandatory can be used. So if I'm non face to face, so back to my, my couple in Calgary, where I wasn't face to face with them, maybe I haven't identified them face to face and I won't be able to be face to face with them again until possibly after closing, then I could use a mandatory. A mandatory is an individual who can do the identification on your behalf. And I'll give you an example of that. I had a call from a Perry Sound Royal Page agent, this is a couple years ago, she called me and said, I have three people that own a property here in Perry Sound. And one of them lives here, but the other two live in downtown Oakville. And I'm the manager for the downtown Oakville location. So the downtown Oakville location, the, the individuals, the other two people on, on title came into the branch. I sat with them, they gave me their driver's license, I copied the first page of the FinTrack form and identified those two individuals on behalf of Miss Royal LePage in, in Perry Sound. Sent them the, sent them the, uh, sent her the, the pages that I filled out. She filled out the other three pages and we signed an agreement called a mandatory agreement where I said, yes, I did this on your behalf. It's in our FinTrack file. If you get into that situation, let us know and we can help you. I believe it's a mandatory agreement also in web forms if you're searching for it. 
So just a few options in how you can identify your client. So we're talking about the individual identification information record form. This is a form you're using pretty much every day in your business. So you should really know it by now and really be able to um, manage with this form uh, pretty succinctly. So the top of the form is obviously the transaction property address. So in that particular line, you recognize that every time there's a transaction involved, you have to identify the client. So if they're buying on Main Street and selling on, you know, Smith Drive, <laughs> that you have an, an individual identification record for each of those transactions, even though it's the same client, really important. So transaction property address gets filled out in entirety with the postal code and the province. Postal code and province are absolutely essential, okay? We're in the age of compliance. Please make sure the postal code and address, that the postal code is complete um, in the address field. Your name as a sales representative. And then of course the date that you are doing this identifying, whether it's a credit file method or face-to-face -face or digitally. Then we get into the full legal name of the individual. The full legal name needs to be what they provide you. Um, and their current address, again, with postal code, postal code, postal code. I keep saying that because when we, when people aren't getting paid, it's because they didn't plug in the postal code. That's like 50% of the reasons that that delays these things. Their date of birth, and of course, their nature of principal business or occupation. Also really important to be very specific here and as detailed as you can be. So I'll give you an example, doctor, not okay. Doctor of family medicine, fine. Doctor of philosophy, uh, professor at University of Toronto in philosophy department, something very specific. FinTrack always will ask for this to be specific. In my former uh, title, I was a broker of record at a small brokerage and we had a, an audit done. This was the only mistake that they found. One of our agents had put uh, entrepreneur and not been very specific about um, self-employed, has a spa in downtown, wherever it was. It was very specific information that FinTrack's looking for. When you're filling these out, if you're doing the face-to-face -face method, or you're using the driver's license, we call it method, use A1 section here. That specifically gives the type of identification number, what the jurisdiction number is, as well as the issuing jurisdiction and the expiry date. Obviously everything that you ask for for identification purposes must be current. It can't be expired, right? So that's really important. If you're doing the credit file method, you fill out A2, and if you're doing the dual ID process method, you fill out, again, completely A3, okay? So specifically to the photo ID method, we're talking about a document that is federally or provincially, federally or provincially issued, okay? This cannot be a library card from a municipal library. It has to be driver's license, passport, that kind of thing. It must be unexpired, obviously. It must have a unique identifier number, which seems like an obvious thing, but maybe isn't always. And then again, in the face-to-face -face method, we talked about how in this, when we write this course, it's, it says you can't view it online. Currently you can, okay? That's really important and that it must be an original piece of identification. So tips and tricks, um, get good at identifying what a real ID looks like. Okay, you're not a bouncer, you don't work at the LCBO, but it's important that you understand some elements of, um, of, of fake ID, obviously. Um, and then of course, um, when we talk about the record keeping requirement, 
all of these things are required to be on file. These four forms or these four page forms are what you are required to hold, okay? They have to be kept in your, um, specifically in your files. So the, the second option is the credit file method. So again, the credit file must be located in a Canadian credit bureau. That's really important. Um, the credit file must have at least one trade line since it was created. And the oldest can't be in existence or sorry, must have been in existence for at least three years. So it's, it has to be current again, right? And that the credit file number is original and unique to that person. And again, that a current address is being used again with postal code, all right? The important thing here is getting consent. So we do have a consent form. Um, I'll pull it up later. Um, that says, yes, I consent to my um, credit file being pulled for the purposes of identification. This isn't what you see in the BRA. The BRA, the buyer's rep agreement, does give you consent to check their credit. That's not what you're doing. You're checking their credit file to make sure that you can identify this person, uh, um, a very different requirement, okay? The dual ID process method, um, I personally, if I was identifying someone, I would tend to use this process maybe before I use the credit file method. Um, and what ultimately you're doing, again, is you're collecting from any two reliable sources information about their name, their address, their date of birth, okay? If, for instance, we can't get a date of birth, because sometimes that's a little trickier to get, um, sometimes, not always, um, depending on the individual. Um, and I, I use this example sometimes, like perhaps the person's, say they're 85 and they've lived in the same house for 40 some years. They don't have an active driver's license. They haven't had a, a valid passport in many years. Um, you can't use a health card in any way to identify people, right? So what do they have? Their, they, their original, um, birth certificate was issued in another country. They don't have it anymore. So these are the kinds of things that you have to think ahead about when you're working with maybe elderly clients. And this is also a way for you from a business perspective and a best practice, maybe this person needs help obtaining a new card or a new piece of information, a, a, an Ontario a residence card, for instance, that just shows those kinds of things. You can help them in that way. We are a service business. Maybe they, they're going to need that. If they sell their house, they're moving into maybe a long-term care facility. Um, and this is a way for you to help them and, and be their family's agent for life, right? So when you're talking about the dual ID process method, we get into sort of um, later in the course, what are some of these reliable sources um, and independent sources? But these can be um, government issued information, anything from CRA, um, hydro bills, utility bills, those kinds of things, okay, that we're talking about. And again, filling out the form as fully and as accurately as you can. So that's really for individuals. When we're talking about identifying corporations and entities, again, a very different form. So this form exists and it, it basically shows um, that you've collected information about the entity that you're working with. So whether it's a numbered company, it could be a corporation. Um, a lot of people now are registering PREX, personal real estate corporations in Canada. You may be called on to identify that PREC in some way if they're, if they're part of purchasing a property that you're working with, okay? So in order to properly um, identify this company or entity, you need to obtain a copy of their corporate records. So certificate of incumbency, articles of, articles of incorporations, or bylaws which set out the officers that, are, that, that can sign on behalf of the corporation, right? So you're looking for a link in that paperwork that says, yes, Mr. Smith can sign on behalf of the ABC Corporation right? There's also databases that you can search these companies, and we'll get into that in the second part of the course. 
where you're confirming the names of the directors and officers, that's an important element as well. But taking it a step further, you're not having to identify everybody in that corporation for the purposes of each transaction. You are looking to identify the corporation and the individuals that are signing on behalf of that specific transaction, okay? So there could be 10 directors in that company, but only two of them are gonna be signing the offers for the property that they're trying to buy with you. Those two individuals will also need to be identified on the individual identification information records, okay? So that file becomes a little bit different your FinTrack file becomes a little bit different for, for companies and entities. But in that being said, um, you're making sure to keep track of what information you have and your, your data record keeping is intact. Sometimes there are mandatories that can be used. Um, I've heard of a, a lawyer in the past um, being a mandatory to identify the um, individuals that were signing on behalf because it was all done uh, virtually. Like, and that does happen more and more. So if you get into that situation, just again, speak to your manager. So when we look at the corporate entity identification information record, again, the completeness and accuracy of this form really is what FinTrack would be looking for if they're doing any kind of audit or examination. And again, you're filling out the corporate address fully and completely, the nature of that company. So maybe it's a holding company or maybe it's a, it's a research company or whatever it is, making sure that you're very clear what that company does, why it's set up. And then the name of the directors that are in there and identifying each one of them um, that are signing, again, that are signing. And then keeping a copy of the corporate records. So you don't need an original copy. You can take a photocopy of their articles of incorporation, for instance. No one will ever be expected to hand over their um, actual articles of incorporation. They, they're, they're owned by the corporation. They must keep them because they're asked for these things. So having a copy of those is expected, okay? We talked about business relationships a couple times already um, and what we say versus what FinTrack says, we being the corporate brokerage, but FinTrack obviously identifying that um, if there's at least two transactions done in a five-year period, that we're keeping track, that we're making sure that these repeat businesses um, are cause for some sort of monitoring, right? That we, they're on our, they're on our list of, ongoing clients, okay? Um, every transaction we talked about has to have a separate FinTrack file, right? So every transaction is deemed to have its own full FinTrack file. I get the question all the time, well, do I have to re-identify them? I just identified them last month. Well, no, you don't have to re-identify them because the sale versus the buy but you have to make sure that information you have is still valid, right? And we've seen that happen where I did the buy and then we're getting their house ready and a month passes and it's like, oh, you know what? You had a birthday in there and your driver's license expired now. You can't use that again. You have to wait for that to be uh, updated, um, but ultimately make sure that whatever you're provided is not expired, okay? And that they're, separate transactions, separate FinTrack file. So we talk about third-party verification. Um, and this is another area that we often have, um, we'll say, questions around. So um, with regards to the third-party verification, what does it mean? What is, a third, what is the definition of a third party? So ultimately, it's an individual or it's an entity um, who is involved in the transaction, okay? That's either giving instruction or possibly providing financial assistance to. So a very common example of that is um, Joey and Susie are buying a condo and um, Susie's dad is helping 
with the deposit, right? Susie's dad is considered a third party. So Susie's dad has to show up in our third party record, okay? That's your job, again, to know your clients. Now, say Susie's dad says, you know what, here, honey, take the $20,000 and put it in your bank account. I don't wanna know, you guys are smart, you figure it out yourself. And that sort of hits her bank account before they offer and before they search. Is there a third party involved? Not really, right? Because the money's now hers. That money was gifted to her, it's in her account. There's no third party check being written for a deposit, for instance, once the transaction is underway, okay? That's sort of an important thing to do, especially with first time buyers. Like have these conversations ahead of time. You know, another way to get to know your clients and for you to be confident in who you're representing, ultimately. We will get into filling this out specifically. I will pull this out. When we get on the break, I'll show you an infograph on how this really should be filled out properly. But the key is, this is the second page of the individual in, uh, identification record. This has to be touched. Is the transaction being conducted on behalf of a third party? Yes or no? No. Say it isn't. No. Asked if the client was acting behalf. I did ask. Yes, I asked. And what date? What date did you ask? That's what we're looking for there. That's what FinTrack wants to know, that you were very clear and you said, okay, there's nobody else involved. Great. If they refuse to ask, they didn't want to provide information. If you asked and they said, yeah, but we don't want to talk about it, then you tick that off. The client would not provide. If there isn't anybody, then it's other, nobody. We asked and there is no one. And if there is grounds to suspect, so if there's grounds for to suspect, then explain it. If there isn't, then check no. So if there is a third party, back to the top, yes, there is someone. And I asked on this date, and this is the name of the person, daddy, you know, big bucks, and his address, his date of birth, his principal occupation, okay? So really important that you have those conversations. You don't want to spring it on someone, you know, after you got the deposit and right before they're about to close. Oh, did somebody give you money? Like, do I have to, you know, do those things now? When you're identifying someone, is there anybody else that's going to be, that we should be, you know, consulting with during this process? Is anybody providing you other than your bank? And through your own savings, is there anybody we need to be aware of so that this portion of the FinTrack form gets filled out, filled out in a wholesome way, okay? And we will show an infograph about that in a few minutes. And it's available to you if you want to sort of look at it later. It's all in the infographs that were shared with you um, when the, the link to this Zoom class was shared. Excuse me, my voice is a little dry. Take a sip. So receipt of funds record, we fill this out when? When we're working with buyers. We're a full service company. When we take our buyer's deposit and we hand it over to the listing agent's brokerage, right? So imagine it like that. It's not like, oh, I'm the listing agent, so I'm, I'm the receipt. No, your client, your receipt of funds as the buyer agent, right? So this needs to be filled out for every buyer transaction. And if it's a multiple representation, we're representing both, both sides. Obviously we need this as well on the buy side. So ultimately, again, transaction property address, very specific with postal code, your name and the date that this receipt was, the receipt of funds was filled out. The amount that the funds were received and in what currency? Obviously Canadian, but not always obviously. 
um, the date of the funds that they were received and then in what format. So was it a bank draft? Was it a certified check? Which is ultimately what we want from everybody now. If it's a wire transfer, then you notify it in the other category here. So purpose of funds, obviously deposit for first purchase. I'm gonna say obviously, because that's what we're talking about. Um, and then with regards to, um, is there anybody that needs to be identified in addition? So that's your opportunity to read that. And you can really see at this point, if they're your buyer, you've already identified them. So C isn't really as relevant. When we get into D is when we start to identify what kinds of, um, what kind of payment came in. So did it come in um, through the agent? And again, what currency? And then ultimately what we're looking for here is the accounts that were affected where did this come from and identifying which accounts were affected okay i'm going to give you a couple examples say it's a fifty thousand dollar deposit and susie's giving thirty thousand and bobby's giving twenty thousand on here you're going to identify there were number one from susie and from susie's account and hers was a bank draft and number two was Bobby's and his account and his was a certified check. So on this page, you identify it came on this day, the 50,000, but it came in two forms. Okay. Fast forward, Bobby and Susie are expected to give another 50,000 in a month, uh, 30 days before the close date, for instance. You need a second receipt of funds you need to complete a second receipt of funds because it's a different date, right? That comes later. So the two different checks on the same day, for instance, which happens, or, and rather, if there's a second deposit on a second date, then a second receipt of funds is required. Now, receipt of funds, it is expected by FinTrack that we identify what accounts are affected. So where did the, what bank accounts did these come from? That is FinTrack's expectation. At the bottom of this page, say someone hands in a bank draft, okay? Happens all the time. And maybe they collected their money from a few accounts and they didn't really want someone to know, like I didn't have, $10,000 in one place. I wanted to get it from here and here and here, for instance. If there's multiple accounts affected, FinTrack's expectation is that you're identifying that it was Susie's checking account, Susie's uh, other checking account, and Susie's ch savings account that these all came from. FinTrack expects each one of those accounts to be identified. If Susie says, I'm not giving you that. You identify that response at the bottom of this page. Receipt of funds, reasonable measures. I asked for the accounts to be identified. The buyer, client refused to provide. Okay, really important. We also have some examples of how this form can be filled out in multiple ways that uh, I believe Ligia and Sandra have, um, but if not, we'll make sure you have a copy of it. And certainly from the administrator's perspective, for anybody who's an administer, administrator or um, office clerk or deal secretary, we can share some of that information. We had uh, someone from um, head office participate in this session last quarter, I believe, and we sort of said, okay, let's fill this out and let's play what, out what it looks like. So we do have copies of that we can share with you. That's just an aside. Okay. So we're moving on. It's, uh, it's two o'clock. I'm going to wrap this up shortly. 
Um, but we will take a break in a little bit, just as an FYI. I know I'm talking a lot. There's a lot of information here, but we're going to push on and, uh, and take a break shortly. So FinTrack reporting. When we're talking about suspicious transaction reports, the transactions that you have reasonable grounds to suspect. Honestly, you have to be very clear here. If you have some sort of, and I call this the hair on the back of your neck, like if this is your litmus test, if something doesn't feel quite right, talk to your manager, okay? We will then take it from there. It is up to the compliance officer of our brokerage or brokerages in the West to make these reports, okay? Same with large cash transaction reports. Again, we do not make a habit of, of taking cash. We did have a situation not long ago where somebody was um, doing a deposit for leases actually under the 10K mark. And we didn't catch it right away, but we realized later, oh my goodness, they were actually trying to deposit cash. That was ended up being a suspicious transaction report or sorry, a large cash transaction report. Very rare does that happen. And then of course, a terrorist property report. And I will say, it's not just us that should have our like hairs on the back of our neck standing up. If you hear about something like this, you don't just come to us. We have to go to the RCMP and CSIS as well. That's serious stuff, obviously. This is exactly why FinTrack operates to stop and deter these things from happening. So if there's anything that you hear or think or feel that something's not right, talk to your manager, okay? And I really stress that. From our perspective, the brokerage will then, if there is a situation where we need to provide a report, then we will be asking you for your records and we will be doing our own investigation and we will, and, and you might not even know about it, nor will your manager. Because if we get wind of something in the FinTrack department, often it's, it needs to be kept quiet for, for lots of different reasons, legal reasons as well. But the brokerage will conduct this investigation and it will keep its own records and it will ultimately decide if there's further actions, i.e. a suspicious transaction submission or not, okay? But ultimately, if that does happen, usually we would come to you and say, look, I need all the information. Maybe they get it from your deal secretary or your assistant or whoever. We need to get the full information um, about the address of the transaction, um, how long we've been in business with this individual, if there's anything that, that needs our attention, any red flags, um, and then, of course, any documentations that we have, okay? There's, a, there's an internal assessment done ultimately. And then at that point, the decision maker, our compliance officer, broker of record, makes the decision whether or not we take this forward, okay? Really important that we have your cooperation in that. With that, with, when we talk about these record you know, keeping, we are not, FinTrack does trump PIPEDA, I will say that. So FinTrack, when we talk about collecting and, and keeping records of private information, um, we are bound by that regardless as a brokerage. Um, but if, if we do need to, to you know, investig investigate something and assess something, um, that's, that actually trumps everything else, just as an FYI. Um, that being said, um, when, we, when we're looking at those kinds of record keeping, of course, everything has to be held in the utmost of secure locations under lock and key, um, you know, not sort of left in the backseat of your whatever. Um, these, are, these, are this, these should be encrypted information if you're keeping it in the cloud. It should be in Canada. Um, all of that information, everything that bounds us in PIPEDA, bounds us in FinTrack and for the brokerage as well as your own files. So really important that with regards to your information that you're keeping it, um, you know, by in within those same laws of PIPEDA, okay? Um, I'm going to just mention at this point that um, from, <laughs> 
from the penalty position, there are expected increases. Um, we teach this course in the most serious way that we can. I mean, I try to keep it a little bit light because I know it's a lot of information, but, but the reality is, is that FinTrack is going to come knocking. Um, they already have, like I said last year to our, one of our brokerages out West, they're coming back again. Um, and, and we have to be sure that what we're doing is, is, is by the law and that how you're conducting yourself and your business is within the, the proper rules, regulations, and legal boundaries, okay? If you do have something that you feel is suspicious or you're not quite sure about something or someone's giving you a difficult time on any of this, just talk to your manager. That's really why we're here to help you with this stuff. Um, or, or call me, like contact me if, if for whatever reason you, you can't reach your manager. There's, we're always here to help you. Um, that's what, what we're here for. Um, and then of course, if there is this suspicious, if there's something really not fitting together properly, talk to your manager. Um, I'm going to take a break right now. Um, so I know there's probably some questions um, I think what we'll do in the next little bit, we'll probably take, it's, it's uh, just 10 after two Eastern Standard Time. Um, we'll probably take about a five to seven minute break. Um, so why don't we say, we'll come back at about, well, why don't we say about 2.20, we'll get going again. Um, and, uh, and we'll see you back shortly. Take a little break, thank you.
So um, for those of you who are still with us, um, I mentioned that I would be bringing up a couple of infographs just to show you um, examples of what I'm referring to. So I did, can everyone see the infograph that I'm sharing? I think you probably can. Um, so with regards to um, the photo ID method, I talk about the health card. Um, it's against the Ontario health privacy law to use the health card, um, people's health cards for any identification purposes. So you can't use that. So again, really important, um, you know, that you, you don't use that. Use the driver's license, okay? Um, a Canadian passport, Ontario photo card, photo card. That was what I was referring to when I talked about sort of the 85 year old individual that may not have a driver's license, may not have a passport, that's a really good way to add value to your clients, right? Um, we talk about the third party verification. So again, just filling out this first top part, the first question is not okay. You really have to dig in a little bit here, okay? We have these forms returned all the time. Um, because the agent, you, your business, you're the independent contractor, your clients, you have to be filling this in properly. So here we have an appropriate way to fill in the uh, verification of third parties. Okay, so is this transaction being conducted on behalf of a, another person, a third party? No. Did I ask? Yes, I asked. Okay. I asked on this date and you fill in the date. See here where the green letters are and then indicate whether there are any grounds to suspect. No, because I asked and they said no. Okay, that's the proper way to fill this out. This is in your package of information that you received just to be aware. If there is a third party, so again, a third party is a person or entity who instructs another person or entity to conduct a financial transaction on their behalf, right? It's not about who owns or benefits from the money. So it's not that Susie's name is going on title, but it's about who's carrying out the transaction and gives instructions on how this money can be handled, right? So daddy's giving the money before we start into the transaction process daddy needs to be identified okay so then you fill out the top part yes there is someone and then you go down to the bottom b2 and you fill this part out fully okay does that make sense i just wanted to show that i think that's a really important thing for you all to know okay can you now see the new? So Denise, always one to correct me, thank you. The reality is, is you do have to indicate in B1 that there is a third party and then you go down to the bottom and complete B2. So that's really important that you, that you make sure that you have B1 is ticked off, that there is someone and that you fill out B2, okay? Um, is there anything, Sandra, in terms of questions that came up in the first part um, that we should address before we move forward? Let me just see, okay. So as I said, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep moving here. Um, it's just past the 220 mark um, and we're gonna dive into the forms. This section of the course takes on, it goes a little faster, um, but again, if there's any questions, please put it in the chat and we'll absolutely, um, we'll, get, we'll circle back to it. Um, So 
Karen, I am going to circle back how to identify an, an elderly person. We, we, t we will talk about that a little bit more with regards to the dual ID process method. Okay, so just stay, stay with me. Okay, so completing FinTrack forms. Um, the corporate, broker corporate brokerage FinTrack policy. So a really important, and we talked about this right at the beginning of the course. Our FinTrack compliance regime is you taking this course, us updating it on a regular basis, and continuing to teach it to new people that enter the brokerage, as well as corporate um, identifying what our corporate policy is, having you sign this. And then ultimately there's a quiz. And I'll share the link to the quiz later on. Um, and that really is part of the, the three tiers that we have with regards to compliance from a FinTrack perspective. I will say ours is probably a more stringent compliance regime than most other brokerages um, across, the, across the country. And in fact, I would say most brokerages now take their cue from us <laughs> because we are so um, um, compliant, quite frankly. So just to go through our, bro bro our corporate um, brokerage FinTrack policy, no cash deposits, obviously, um, maybe not obviously, but are to be accepted on any real estate transaction. Realtors must fully complete all required FinTrack forms before submitting deals. Administrative and accounting staff are not permitted to add or edit or complete these forms once we get them. Okay, so it's really, again, your business, your clients, your forms, your contracts, your deals. Okay, the staff can point things out to you, but ultimately you are responsible as the agent. You're the one that holds the license. It is your client. Okay, so you really need to be taking it up a notch if you're expecting the staff to do this for you, that's not what, 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 how we conduct our businesses. It's you're the professional, it's your deals, it's your clients, okay? Really clear. No commissions get paid out, obviously, maybe not obviously, unless all the FinTrack documentations, including your client information, receipt of funds, have been fully completed, okay, and submitted. So we need them. We get the question often, when is the best time to fill these things out? And my, my consistent answer is at earliest possible time. When you're working with someone, you want to know who you're working with. This form is a great way to break the ice with that. Um, it's nice to have those nice, gentle conversations, but ultimately, you're the pro. You need to know who you're working with. This is major transactions. This is a lot of money that will be trading hands. Absolutely, absolutely within your professional mandate to get this information early on. If a client or business relationship is identified as being high risk, then immediately report this to the compliance officer, okay? This is something that we haven't had to deal with a lot, quite frankly, um, but we do expect that of you. If anyone is aware of a suspicious transaction or attempted suspicious transaction at any time during the course of a real estate transaction, again, must be um, sent up to the, uh, the compliance officer who is also our broker of record. Um, his name is Augustino Monteleone or Gus Monteleone. And he is at our Young and York Mills location, area manager for Central Toronto. Um, he's a very nice man, very knowledgeable, very attentive, knows his stuff. Um, and between Gus, myself, and there's a few others, we're sort of the FinTrack department uh, for the corporate brokerage. Um, I teach a lot of this stuff, but we all contribute. Um, as you know, these, there's things that are ongoing. Yay, Gus, Bruce Huggins says, you're right, he's awesome. Um, and then with regards to your record keeping, um, make sure that you're holding on to these forms for five years. So all of these forms that you collect, you're keeping 
in your records for up to five years. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit. So understanding FIDRAC forms. We talked about the receipt of funds record. We talked about the individual identification information record. We also talked about the different methods for identifying individuals. We talked about the corporate entity identification information record, as well as IDing clients through an agent mandatory. Okay, really, really important um, that you have these clients um, identified if at all possible with face-to-face -face methods, that's, that's ideal. But of course, FinTrack has given us these other ways to identify individuals if we can't be face-to-face. -face. So what do we keep in our files? So if this is a regular, let's call it residential transaction and you're working on behalf of the buyer, then you are required to have a receipt of funds record. Right. In addition, the individual identification information record. If you're working with a seller, the individual indivi sorry, individual identification information record is required for anybody who is on title. OK. We do have in the back of your books that you would have received from Ligia. Um, it's all of this course, but in the back, um, I can't pull it up right now because uh, I don't have it, but in the back, there's a really good, I call it a cheat sheet, and it really does help you figure out who identify in what situation. So if there's an estate sale, if there's a power of attorney, um, if there's, um, you know, someone like out of the ordinary that gets involved, a third party, Who's a third party? This is a really good cheat sheet. It's at the back of the book that you get with this course. Um, and it can help you sort of break some of that down. But again, if you have any questions, just let, let us know. With regards to commercial transactions, um, again, your receipt of funds record for the individuals that are, are bringing the money forward. Um, and of course, how those get filled out. The individual identification record for the person acting on behalf of the corporate entity in that specific transaction, right? So you're not having to identify all the directors for that company, but specifically the ones that are signing the agreement of purchase and sales specific to this transaction. They require the individual identification record. And then of course, the corporate entity identification record and a photocopy of one of those either articles of incorporation, um, anything that that again connects the signing officers to the corporation, right? So you need a photocopy of that. So again, receipt of funds record when we're working with buyers um, is required for all resale transactions and is being completed when the funds are received. OK, we don't accept cash, obviously. So those are coming in the form of bank drafts, of um, certified checks, sometimes a personal check that maybe gets swapped out, that kind of thing. But ultimately, those are the, the best ways. But now, obviously, during COVID, we're getting a lot more wire transfers. Um, that is also an important element in this course is to understand what it is that a wire transfer is done. You all have very specific instructions um, that the brokerage sent out. Um, we edited it slightly in um, sort of spring of last year when we re recognized less and less people were dropping off checks um, for lots of different reasons and more and more people were, were doing these wire funds transfers. Um, if, if in fact these are happening, they, they can be identified on these receipt of funds as well. Um, it takes a bit of forensicking on our accounting staff to, to know which money is connected to what deals. So really important that you fill out those forms um, really clearly. So we know what money is connected to what deals, okay? 
I think in the case of a, a, if the client is a corporation, um, so that we talk about this, and unless you deal with this on a regular basis, they this might seem like a bit um, obscure for you, but ultimately these corporate records um, it contain they these corporate records contain the provision um, that bind the corporation, okay? And who can sign on behalf of the corporation? Because don't forget in, in Canadian law, corporations are its own entity, right? So it's like, who speaks for this entity? Who can sign on behalf of the, the entity? We also require um, a copy of how this, basically the articles of incorporation, how this corporation conducts itself right? Um, keeping in mind that we're not required to identify all the people that are part of this corporation. Again, only the ones specifically signing for this transaction. Okay. We get into a bit of the obscure again, when we talk about um, receipt of funds that aren't our client, right? So if there is someone that we're receiving money that isn't our client, um, if the the cooperating realtor, for instance, is, is getting this money without us intervening. It's really important that we work cooperatively, right, in our industry. So the cooperating realtor is asked in that case to, to fill this out or to at least get the consent to fill something like this out. If you confirm the existence of this entity, if we know and, and the reason we go into this is that, is this a third party or are these people part of the transaction, right? If, if there's this, this other entity, then there is, an, there, there is another party, obviously, because there's the person signing and then there's the entity. So really important to be very clear on that, um, especially when you're handing in your, your FinTrack files with, with the transaction. So who's, who's responsible for the deal? whose name is on the transaction, for instance, if it's an individual, making sure we've identified them properly, that we have the appropriate information on the receipt of funds, that we've identified the accounts, hopefully we've identified the accounts that are being affected by this transaction. And it's interesting, I, I sat, I've sat, sat through many fin, FinTrack um, conferences and, and teacher series and whatnot, and um, consistently the feedback from a lot of brokers and brokerages are, well, why does FinTrack wanna know that? Like that's, that's not our job to figure this out. Like we shouldn't be asking these things of our client. And FinTrack is very black and white. And I've been in the room with some people from FinTrack like that work for FinTrack and they're like, this isn't a question, this is the law. So if you're, <laughs> If you find yourself in that position and you really are uncomfortable for some reason asking for this information, again, this is the law. And, and again, FinTrack is very black and white with how we have to ask what we need to know. And if we don't get it, then where we, where we have to record that ultimately. So basic information is obviously on the receipt of funds the property address, your name, the date that the form is being completed. So usually that day, obviously, I, I wanna say obviously, but sometimes it's not as obvious. Um, the information on the funds. So we talk about it as being the name and address and the principal business if the funds are received from an entity or if it's an individual that that information is already collected on the individual. So as a buyer rep, having a receipt of funds record, I'm going to say you should already have the information, the individual information record filled out on that client, right? So that you don't have to go back and say, oh, I'll fill it out later. The earliest possible time, fill out the individual sheets, then when you get into the receipt of funds record, it's just another layer of information, okay? We talk about D2. So again, top of page two on the receipt of funds. And we talk about the, uh, the account and 
the, the institution name and the full name of the account holder and the currency. And this is where we ask what account numbers, okay? Really important to ask that. If for whatever reason we don't get it, then you notify that or you make that notification on the E section that you asked and they would not provide, okay? That's just an, it's a, it's like a footnote. And again, our receipt of funds records, um, like all of our FinTrack files, we keep up to five years. Okay. So now let's talk about methods. So methods of identifying clients. We talk about photo ID. We talk about that being face to face normally. Now, a slightly different time. Um, FinTrack has given us some leeway there. The credit file method, again, I, I, always, I suggest maybe this should be the third option, um, but nonetheless, it might be the only option. Um, and I think one of the questions that were in the Q&A, you know, how do we identify someone who's maybe elderly? Well, here's a great way to do that. Everyone carries credit file. There's, you know, if you've been a Canadian citizen or if you've been living in Canada for any period of time, really, then you carry a credit file. So this is a great way to identify um, an individual that maybe doesn't have the driver's license or doesn't have an, um, a valid passport or you don't have a copy of an original birth certificate, for instance, to identify what the date of birth is. And just remember, this element of identification, it's, it's data collection. That's, that's ultimately what your role is. Data collection and maintaining safe records, right? Private safe records. The dual ID process method, you can obtain data. So again, name, address, date of birth, the digital DNA, I call it. Um, by, by using multiple sources, right? So two original, valid, and current documents from independent and reliable sources. The obligation really is consistent. Um, if you're filling the forms out correctly, it's consistent with keeping records, the identifier number of, in the case of the photo ID, the driver's license, for instance, the type of document it is, um, the document number, the issuing jurisdiction, expiry date, and then, of course, when you verified it. Because that matters. Data verification matters. Um, and I'll give you an example. I identify my client with their driver's license on January 12th. We do the transaction and January 30th, their driver's license expires. February 30th, or sorry, March 30th, the deal closes. It doesn't matter that their identify like that their date of verification, that information is no longer valid when it closes. It matters that when you took that information down, it was valid at that time. So it's important to, like some people are like, oh, it doesn't matter when I filled it out. It does, because when you filled it out, it was valid. It became expired. And when we went to close, that doesn't matter, okay? If you have to re-identify them for a buy later and their driver's license is expired, then that matters. Okay, so really important to keep that clear. An important element of identifying person um, when you're identifying individuals is trying to keep that clear. And from a, best, from a business practice position, a good way to sort of re-engage people too, like, oh, so when I filled this out last, you were a teacher, are you still teaching? Maybe it was six months ago, or maybe it was a year ago. 
keeping these files, having an active understanding of what your client is engaged in, that kind of thing. It's, it's, a, it's a small thing, but sometimes it makes a difference. Um, there's a question coming up. I'm gonna circle back to that in a minute um, with regards to <clears throat> putting other people on title. So the photo ID method, again, um, you can use a valid current original photographic identification issued by federal, federal, provincial or territorial government. So not municipal, okay? And not a health card, really important. You must view it and it, ideally face-to-face. -face. If you can't be face-to-face, -face, FinTrack is making the exception at this point that you can do it digitally, like uh, on online, we'll call it FaceTime, Skype, I don't know how many people still Skype. More people are doing Google Meets and Zoom than ever before. Um, but I mean, at this point during COVID, that's allowed. Will they convert to that long term? That remains to be seen. Um, but what they are expecting that the individual who is doing that digital identification that you note that on the individual information form. Okay, that's really important. And then if you can, when you can circle back and do the face to face and note that on the form as well. So again, client's name, the type of ID or document used, the unique identifier number, um, as well as the issue in jurisdiction and the country of the document, the expiry date, and the date on which you verify the information. The credit file method really used in situations when I say, again, should be sort of the third method that we talk about, but because it, it's really when nothing else works, when you don't have anything else, you relay, you rely on a credit file search. So you must conduct the search. Um, at the time you ascertain, ascertain your client's identity, the client doesn't need to be present, obviously, and shouldn't be. Um, the client shouldn't be providing this, ultimately. It's you, which is why you should get their consent, okay? Um, you don't need a credit assessment. And that's the point of this, is that you're getting their, let's say their consent to check their identification in this method, not to ascertain any credit information. Okay, really important. Um, and it's accessible to use an automated system. Um, and, and Equifax, for instance, is an example of, of someone that we would use. TransUnion, I think, is another one. So you can rely on a third party vendor um, that has an entity outside of Canada, but it really has to be um, someone that is affiliated really to a, a large, a like a foreign affiliate bank. It can't be sort of, and, and the point FinTrack is making here is it can't just be a one-off credit union. Like it has to be someone recognized, um, otherwise it should be within Canada, okay? Keeping in mind that you can use a mandatory as well. If the mandatory is doing this, and we talked about the mandatory, having a mandatory agreement, but if they're doing this on your behalf, it's these are really the other methods that they could use as well. The dual ID process method, for instance, um, where you can do something face to face. Um, again, record, the record keeping for the, the, the credit file method, the name of the third party um, ascertaining the identity, the method of the identification used, the information that was gathered, the date on which the third party identified the identity of or verified the identity of the client, the date the reporting entity referred to the client identification information provided, and a copy of the agreement if the client identification is conducted by an agent or mandatory. So that's an important element too. 
um, again, back to if you're if somebody else is doing in this on your behalf. Whoops. Missed one. So the dual ID process method, and this this might be the route to go again if we're talking about the 80 year old or 85 year old who maybe wasn't born in this country, again, back to not having a valid driver's license or passport, you can't use the health card. Um, maybe you're gonna help them get this photo card through Service Ontario. Um, a lot of that you have to do online now, but you can do it, it takes time, which is, again, if you know this listing is coming up, um, again, from a business practice, uh, helping this client um, go through those sort of that red tape and it is red tape let's be honest that's like government identification is red tape but they're going to need that down the road as well right like knowing that maybe they're going into this long-term care facility how can i help like what can i do to you know make this process easier for them the good news with the, the dual IT process method is you don't have to be face to face. Again, this is something that can be done, um, you know, digitally. So it says that you must view the original valid and current document. So again, if this is something that can be emailed, which can be at this time, FinTrack is allowing for that, right? Normally you would sort of say, okay, give me that, give me this. And then I would take the information down. Um, from the information that you provide. FinTrack is saying at this time that those can be electronically obtained. So let's talk about the data points. So the dual ID process method takes multiple pieces of information to ascertain the specific data that we're looking for. Specifically name, date of birth, and name and address. So you're gonna collect the name and date of birth from one source and the name and address from another source. Or you're going to obtain the name and address and then possibly the name and confirm a financial account. So this could be that, um, again, back to the 85 year old who I might not have, in this case, I might not have something that has his date of birth, which is, is it, it when you think about it a birth certificate you know something that's government issued that's where those things sort of can be really truly validated um, if you're using the client's name and date of birth and you don't have a, something that confirms their address for some reason then you can use again their name and this this financial account and what we mean by that is um, confirming a bank account, for instance. But let's let's talk about the, the name and date of birth. So examples, and these are really good little uh, pages to come back to when you're sort of in the thick of it. You're like, well, how do I do this? Like if I have this client that is maybe older or um, I don't, I can't get the information from one place. Um, so the name and date of birth can be obtained from one of these sources. So again, anything that is government issued is golden, right? Like I'm being asked to identify for the federal government, I'm going to use something that the federal government has issued, right? Makes sense. So anything that they've given um, that they have fr from the past, from CRA or um, uh, again, a birth certificate, marriage certificate, marriage documents, divorce documents, um, anything that's even temporary, um, like like they they do give temporary driver's license. Um, and then, of course, when you're talking about um, where these sources can come from, if you're talking about um, referring to the Canadian credit file, again, it has to have existed for six months minimum. Right, so depends on how long they've been here, for instance. It, it can also be insurance documents. That's a, that's a great example, because again, they would have done some verification. Insurance companies, banks, these are also entities that report 
to FinTrack, right? So we're all sort of looking for the same bits of data. You can verify name and address again with anything that's that's issued from the Canadian government or a utility company, right? So I like to say things that are deliverable. So like a hydro or gas bill or something that is specific to um, the 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 T force or something that the the CRA would have would have passed on it at some point. Um, these are things to obtain for ways to obtain their name and and up to date address. Okay. We talk about the financial account and and again this is now we're reaching a little bit like if if we get to this point it's because we're really just trying to find anything that we can verify with their name and something else on it so we can use credit card statements bank statements um, again loan accounts if there was a mortgage on the property a mortgage statement um, you know again this is you're really just reaching now but you can use this data to identify in the dual ID process method. So back when FinTrack was sort of getting up to snuff on all of this stuff, and this is going back several years, um, a decade and a half, um, really FinTrack said, identify them face-to-face -face with, a, with you know, something that we issued, like provincially or federally. And then it came, all these things started coming up. Well, not everyone drives and we can't use a health card. So they've sort of developed these other methods um, for you, all not just you, but agents that are part of the real estate industry that are a reporting entity to FinTrack to, to identify, okay? So these slides, the last few slides are really good sources for you to refer back to if you get into that situation where like, yeah, how do I identify um, my 85 year old who doesn't have this, this or that, okay? There's options. So again, um, for an audit trail purpose, just what information you have to have. Um, number four is very clear, a combination. So a data combination matched with the sources that you took. So identifying that it was the name, date of birth and address. And these are the sources I used. So either Ontario Hydro, CRA, um, TD Bank, uh, um, and Bridge Gas, whoever. Um, and then those specific account numbers or reference number associated with that, okay? So again, data points. FinTrack is an analysis center. They're looking for data to analyze, okay? That's as simple as I can make it. <laughs> So from a business relationship, we talked about it from, we talked about what FinTrack expects and we talk about what we expect. So due to our size and geographic scope, there is a potential of a client having done two or more transactions in the past five years with the corporate brokerage. That's just a full stop fact. So what FinTrack deems is two units or transactions in the last five years we say everybody who we do a deal with we consider to be in a business relationship so really important that page four individual identification or in the entity forms that you complete it that way for the corporate brokerage okay really important so we touched on the agent or mandatory, and we talked about the written agreement that's required. Again, if you're not face-to-face, -face, somebody else is doing this work on your behalf, then you need this also as part of your FinTrack file, a mandatory agreement. There is a mandatory agreement that can be found. We haven't had to reinvent the wheel it exists in web forms, uh, regardless of where what board you're part of, it's in the CREA web forms. Um, and that has to be part of the information that you keep in your FinTrack file. 
this mandatory agreement. Again, the agreement, all the, uh, the identification method that you used, as well as the, the basically the, the first page and a copy of the, the agreement. If in fact, and we talk about these things expiring. So if you collect this information and six months go by and no one does a deal, ultimately, if anything expired, you should re-identify, right? Um, if it didn't expire, you're probably okay. You do need a separate FinTrack file for every transaction. Important that you look at that information and make sure the information you collected, you can reuse that information, just make sure that it's still valid and it's not expired, right? If that's required to happen again, then a new mandatory agreement should be signed as well. It's just as ongoing, ongoing monitoring of that business relationship. Let's shift over to corporation and entity identification for a moment. Um, I know this might be obscure. I, I mentioned this earlier. Not everybody will, will go down this path in their business, but certainly it's important to know that there is a separate form to identify a corporation or entity. And in order to have a fulsome FinTrack file on that entity, you need that form as well as a copy of the certificate of corporate status. Um, you can do a search on these companies. And the next slide actually has a couple of links for that. Again, if you're going down that path and you're not sure of how to search and to make sure that this entity exists, um, then speak to one of your managers. Here is a couple of databases that you can search for the registration numbers, and it does refer to the type of records that are kept there um, because it's all, again, it's like a birth certificate <laughs> for an entity. Um, and these can be searched there. If you're going down the path of commercial, um, our commercial, like Royal Page uh, Commercial, has a whole other set of databases and um, subscriptions to different things that that is definitely you know worth your while to be to get involved in if that's part of your business model. Okay. So, but but an important element here, it could just be a simple corporation that is is you know, maybe it's the third party, maybe it's, um, they want it in the name of the business. Um, and I think one of the question was uh, earlier, Eli, if a person is being added on title, um, not to the contract as per, I think you're you meant to say an amendment, do we need to have FinTrack form for that person? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. If it's done prior to closing. If it's done prior to closing, then absolutely yes, we need to have that person identified as well. If it's being done after closing, it's actually outside of the realm of the transaction. Okay, it's being done usually by the lawyer at that point. If you remember on our forms, uh, or sorry, on our little wheel that we looked at early of the different entities that report to FinTrack, real estate, casinos, uh, precious gems dealers, securities dealers, lawyers are not part of that. Okay, lawyers are actually went to the Supreme Court and said, we're not part of FinTrack, we reserve the right, the, the Law Society of Upper Canada said, we reserve the right to client privilege. We are outside of that, okay? They have other things that they have to do, but they are not an entity that reports to FinTrack. So really important part, part of, and that's an important designation. Is that person going on title before closing or is that person going on title after closing? If it's before closing, they're considered part of the transaction. They're part of the, um, who we would consider a client um, if we represented them. They're an entity as part of this transaction. They must be identified. 